This party's getting crazy. Let's rock. Devil May Cry 3 is one of the best action games I've ever played. It's got a top tier combat system, awesome weapons, badass cutscenes, goofy ass cutscenes, and a surprisingly good story. This game is 19 years old, yet if you were to just touch it up with some modern graphics, I could easily be convinced that it was released this year. Devil May Cry 1 was a solid foundation for its time, and Devil May Cry 2 is genuinely one of the worst games I've ever played. Which is why DMC3's comeback is so legendary. We went from the lowest low of the franchise to its first certified banger entry, which laid the awesome groundwork for what would come in the future. And while pretty much everyone who's a big fan of action games these days knows how awesome DMC5 is, if you really want to get into this franchise, I think 3 is easily the best starting point. It's the one that revolutionized the combat into the complex hype train we know of nowadays, and chronologically its events take place before any of the others. Now, let's begin by discussing the most prominent aspect of the game. For a title that came out in 2005, the level of depth and variety to be found here is kind of insane. And while there's a lot that goes into making the combat as awesome as it is, I think it's important to begin by understanding this game's most important innovation, the style system. In the previous games, the style system was basically a rating determined by your ability to quickly rack up large amounts of damage and hit multiple enemies at the same time, giving you a higher letter grade the better you do. It was it was kind of a neat idea, but nothing groundbreaking. Then DMC3 came out and decided to change it into one of the coolest aspects of any third-person action game. Now your style is directly affected by your ability to continuously damage enemies and always be switching between different moves and combos without getting hit in the process. If all you do is continuously spam the same combo over and over again, you're likely not going to find your way past a C rank, which ultimately isn't a huge deal if your goal is to just beat the game and move on. But man, there are a few things more satisfying than rapidly swapping between different weapons to beat your enemies' asses in a plethora of ways while seeing a visual representation of just how well you're doing at it. Adding this system to the game brings a whole new dynamic to the table, where you aren't simply trying to defeat the enemies and bosses as quickly as possible, but also have some fun trying to be as stylish as you can in the process. Plus, it works nicely as an incentive for the player to experiment with different weapons and abilities. But of course, this system would all be for nothing if the gameplay wasn't actually fun. And luckily, this game's combat easily competes with the most fun and complex melee-centered games found in the modern day. You've got five weapons to choose from, which each have a ton of different moves to unlock. There's Dante's Signature Blade, the Rebellion, Cerberus, a three-section staff you get from defeating, well, a Cerberus. My personal favorite weapon, Agni and Rudra, a pair of blades obtained from two annoying dudes who somehow attached their heads to them. Nevin, a weapon you get from shooting a hot demon lady, which somehow turns her into a guitar that shoots electricity and bats. What? And Beowulf, your classic punch and kick weapon obtained from a soy demon who gets his ass beat by both you and eventually Virgil. Aside from Nevin being a bit situational compared to the rest, the general variety and balance found amongst these weapons is awesome. They've all got their own strengths, such as Rebellion or Agni and Rudra working well for crowd control and juggling, while Beowulf is the most efficient for dealing high damage against a single target. Each of the weapons come with lots of combos which can be executed executed by finding the right times to pause in between button presses, or moving in the appropriate direction in relation to your enemy when locked onto them, which may seem a little unintuitive at first, but it works surprisingly well. They also come with attacks you can use in mid-air, and some even have moves specifically designed to launch your foes into the air so you can follow up by juggling them with your melee weapons and guns. Not to mention, they're just so cool on a superficial level. You can shoot waves of ice, 
conjure flaming tornadoes, throw them at obstacles to knock them into your opponent, infinitely bounce off of dudes with your kicks, or have an awesome jam session. Plus, you've even got five guns to choose from. While they're obviously meant as more of a side option and not as relevant as the melee armaments, it still feels nice that you've got some choices. And they can actually make a pretty significant difference in the right situation. With the ability to swap between two of your weapons and guns at the same time, you always have more more than enough tools at your disposal to continuously keep up a nice style rank which can be further enhanced by whichever style you're currently using. Yeah, aside from the whole style aspect I mentioned earlier, there's another style system which allows you to decide the current function of the B or circle button. Trickster turns it into an iframe dodge, which is really convenient to have, though definitely not necessary since you've still got the basic ability to roll when locked onto enemies. Swordmaster gives you entirely new moves for each of your weapons, Gunslinger does the same thing except for your guns, and Royal Guard allows you to parry enemy attacks, which, when done enough times, will build up a meter that allows you to release a powerful dash forward. There's even a Quicksilver and Doppelganger style, which are both kinda niche, but still enjoyable in their own right. Each style can be upgraded twice by using them enough, which unlocks new abilities such as multiple dashes in a row for Trickster, or more additional moves to use with Swordmaster. Personally, Swordmaster is easily my favorite style. I think Trickster is a nice option for new players, including myself on my first playthrough. And Royal Guard can be ridiculous when you reach its skill ceiling. But after getting used to having awesome additional moves for each of my weapons, I find it a little difficult to go back to any of the other styles. I'll never get enough of launching dudes by spinning Rebellion around and following up with the air combo. Considering how obsessed I was with the Souls games when I initially played DMC3, I was blown away that such an old title could provide so much of what I loved about my favorite games. It's got Souls rolling, Bloodborne dashing, Sekiro parrying, and several badass unique weapons that you obtain from defeating bosses and taking their souls. Overall, while he's definitely gotten some significant significant improvements in the games that followed, DMC3 Dante is still easily one of my favorite action game characters to play as, which is further enhanced by how entertaining his personality is, but we'll talk more about that later. The developers also added a new feature in the special edition of the game where you can play as Virgil, and while he doesn't nearly have the same variety as Dante does, he's still really fun to mess around with. Plus, it's awesome that the moves you get with him are actually the same moves he uses against you in his boss fights. Now you can be the one to say scum. However, as I've discussed before on my channel, having a fun combat system is cool and all, but if the enemies and bosses you face off against don't work to actually complement that system, then it can significantly drag down the experience. When it comes to the enemies, there are a lot of solid ones that work pretty well. The Seven Hells along with the Abyss Dudes are definitely the most consistently fun ones to fight. They each come with slightly different designs and abilities that make them stand out enough from each other, while also being simple to perform combos on since most of them are very easily staggerable. The spiders are also pretty solid, but demand more attention since they often can't be staggered while generally having more punishing attacks. And the chessmen are like tanks that literally can't be staggered, but are also slow enough to the point that they aren't too troublesome to fight in groups. Unfortunately though, all of the other enemies aren't particularly fun to fight in my opinion. Blood goyles force you to use guns on them before finishing them off which isn't very enjoyable. Soul Eaters have a tedious gimmick where you have to turn away before hitting them. Dulahans are also just based on a gimmick where you have to hit them from the back. And the Fallen are easily the worst. The way they fly around and get trapped in walls is such a shitty nuisance that really brings down the fun of every situation you find them in. Luckily, it feels like for the most part, the devs were aware of which enemies are less fun to fight, leading to them not showing up as often as the more basic ones, but it is still a little unfortunate that they drag down certain sections. In terms of boss fights, I'd say they're kind of on a similar level as the enemies, where some are an absolute blast, and others are pretty unimpressive. 
The three different fights with Virgil are the obvious standouts. They're not only the most fun bosses in the game, but also the best bosses I've ever experienced from a game that came out this long ago. For the time that Devil May Cry 3 released, these fights are without a doubt some of the most fair yet challenging bouts that the gaming industry had ever put out. His moves are pretty difficult to learn, with the challenge slowly ramping up in each encounter, but as tough as it gets, it always feels reasonable as as long as you can time your dodges. Plus, when you catch him off guard, you're usually given enough time to pull off some stylish combos. Not to mention, the presentation and music that go along with each of them is great, which is enhanced by the fact that you always face him at a pivotal story moment. And he feels so fitting as your rival, especially in the second and third encounters where you both have periods of utilizing your devil trigger form. His battles are without a doubt the highlights of the game's combat. How are you gonna tell me this isn't hype as hell? Aside from your edgy rival, I also like Hell Vanguard, Cerberus, Jester, Agni and Rudra, which is actually a solid and fair duo fight. Nevin, Beowulf, Garion, and Lady. A couple of them are admittedly kinda gimmicky and not the most well designed, but I think they're a fun time. Sadly, the rest of the fights honestly kinda suck. Managing to find your way on top of Gigapede is sometimes kinda fun, but it's a pretty lame boss overall. Heart of Leviathan is very dull and drawn out, Doppelganger is a joke once you figure out the gimmick, and Arkham, while having a lot of cool and fun cutscenes surrounding the fight, is a genuinely terrible boss. It's like staring into a backed up toilet. As you can tell by my strongly positive view on the game, these subpar enemies and bosses don't come close to ruining the experience for me, but they're without a doubt my biggest gripe with the gameplay. All in all, when you do find yourself in the game's positive encounters, it often does a great job riding the line of being difficult, while also giving your foes some fair tells that allow you to swiftly predict their attacks and punish afterward. There are a lot of details that would fit in this segment of the video which I've skipped over, such as the devil trigger form, turbo mode, the Nintendo Switch version having extra features, or advanced tactics like jump cancelling, but I think you guys get the gist. Game is awesome and super fun with tons of variety. Go play it because the action is top tier. But of course, there is more to it than just the combat. While DMC3 obviously puts fighting at the forefront of its gameplay, there's still a fair amount to like about what the levels themselves have to offer. Similarly to Devil May Cry 1 and 4, this game follows the philosophy of technically being separated into different levels, but for the most part, they're organically connected to each other through one consistent game world. The first couple of missions are set in some regular city streets, but after Virgil summons the giant, difficult to pronounce tower, the game mostly consists consists of exploring its many layers. And while the level design doesn't really compare to the depth and complexity of locations found in stuff like the Souls games or the Resident Evil series, it's still pretty fun to explore. Throughout the game, you'll find yourself in a fair amount of sections where you're looping back to places you've already seen and can now use an item you've obtained to progress further, which is a lot more engaging than if you were to simply run from the beginning to the end every time. A lot of the levels also come with some fun gimmicks along the way, such as having to knock enemies off of an elevator to keep it from falling, needing to complete trials to obtain key items, or having your HP slowly drained in exchange for infinite devil trigger and free health drops from enemies. You'll also find a few puzzles every now and then, which usually aren't particularly difficult to figure out, but there are a few such as the light beam ones that are actually pretty commendable, and do a decent job at giving you some occasional distractions between fighting. Furthermore, there are the common combat adjudicators, which are kind of like tutorials on how to increase your style, and they reward you for doing so with health upgrades. I also think that the tower itself is a pretty cool location. While I personally find the environments and backgrounds here to be outshined by some other games which came out in the same year, such as the original God of War, there's still a lot to like about it. Unfortunately, the game's level design does take a noticeable dip in quality in the last third. After a story event occurs which causes 
causes the tower to get completely restructured. You go through a few missions in a row where the game basically tries to find creative methods to reuse the rooms you've already seen by making them connect in completely different ways than before. Overall, I wouldn't say this stretch feels like it drastically harms the quality of the game, and for what it's worth, it's actually kinda neat to see some weird-ass, broken versions of locations you've previously been to. But it does reek of them running low on development time and needing to pad the game out a bit. Then the last couple of missions take place in Hell, and I think they serve nicely as a cool little spectacle before the finale. The way they connect is a little nonsensical and random, but that's kind of the point considering where they take place. Also, I'm sure some players would see it as a flaw that there's a boss rush near the end, since it feels like adding another layer to the whole padding out issue. But I personally don't mind, since I just see it as an opportunity to have a rematch against some of my favorite opponents. At the end of the day, level design is isn't one of the main appeals of the Devil May Cry franchise, which has been made extra clear in the latest entry where it's taken even more of a backseat. But for what it's worth, I think a lot of the levels in this game elevate it to be a bit more engaging than if it was strictly focused on combat. Before diving into the story, I have to give a shout out to the fantastic direction of this game's cutscenes. By using real actors in cooperation with Just Cause Entertainment, the devs were able to create some genuinely awesome cutscenes that add such an extra level of style and personality in between each of the game's missions. From the very first dramatic scene foreshadowing the brothers' conflict, to the goofy yet amazing introduction to Dante as he beats the shit out of demons in the most humiliating ways possible, to Lady finding unnecessarily creative methods of utilizing her guns, and of course, Virgil being cold and calculated, always managing to defeat every foe before resheathing the Yamato. I'm personally a huge sucker for well-choreographed fight scenes. There's no better way to convince me that a character is badass than actually showing it. And this game combines its awesome choreography with such a perfect level of wacky fun energy that keeps me thoroughly entertained from start to finish. Plus, it's obviously helped by the fact that Dante in this game is one of the most over-the-top, goofy half protagonists I've ever seen. Just look at the way this dude puts on his coat. <laughs> Everything about this man oozes style and a genuine love for battling demons. I love this. This is what I live for! Which translates seamlessly into the feel of the game's combat. The style system, which I raved about earlier, incentivizes the player to always be messing around, going over the top, and having as much fun as they possibly can, mirroring the fun, over-the-top demeanor that Dante exudes 24-7. There are also so many small touches, such as this random in-game cutscene where Dante could just throw this key item into the hole, but instead he has to kick it around, showing off his skills before doing so. In addition, I love how every cutscene at the start of a mission has a hidden number in it, representing which mission it is. That's a cool little easter egg. Some of my personal favorite scenes are this one after the first Virgil fight, where Virgil throws Dante's bullets back at him, which he then chops in half. Lady's coolest cutscene, where the impact of her rocket tosses guns and mags into the air, followed by her seamlessly catching them and translating them into her combos. Welcome back. Dante throwing his sword and then shooting it to make it move even faster, which doesn't matter because he can run quick enough to catch up with it anyway. And of course, Dante riding a motorcycle and then proceeding to use it as a weapon, which also becomes an actual weapon in DMC5. <laughs> The Devil May Cry games that followed this one generally managed to keep a similar level of energy in their cutscenes. Like, I definitely can't complain, a lot of it is really cool. But there's such a peak level of creativity from start to finish in this one that I honestly don't think has ever been matched. 
Since this video is supposed to act kind of like a recommendation, I feel like it would be counterproductive to straight up explain what happens, so instead I'm going to talk about why I think the story works as well as it does. Which obviously starts with the characters. I've subtly teased this a few times throughout my videos, but Dante is one of my favorite protagonists in all of gaming. On a superficial level, this dude is such a perfect combination of being a goofy-ass goober who's just fun to watch, while also having the supernatural natural skills to back up his confidence due to being half-demon. And while I still like him about the same in Devil May Cry 4 and 5, this is definitely my favorite iteration of him. Partially because this is the main game where he actually has some learning to do. Since this is the youngest we ever see him, it's also the time where he's the most cocky and neglectful of any responsibility. But as he continues to interact with Lady and sees the consequences of what can happen when he doesn't deal with his family business, he slowly warms up to the idea that he should be be willing to get his shit done. Not because of personal grudges, but because he's in a situation where he can make a difference where no one else could. Now, I'm not trying to argue that this wacky pizza man has the most complex character arc of all time, but for what it is, I think it's pretty damn effective. And it feels satisfying to see that his development actually translates into his personality going forward. From here on, he retains the same enjoyable demeanor that he's always had, but at the end of the day, he isn't neglectful of his responsibilities anymore. Of course, having a solid protagonist is one thing, but simultaneously introducing one of the most iconic villains in gaming naturally takes things a huge step further. A big part of why Virgil works so well is because, despite being Dante's brother, his personality is the exact opposite. While Dante always makes an effort to be unnecessarily stylish, Virgil never does more than what's required. If he unsheaths the Yamato, then his business is usually complete before he puts it away. Or simultaneously as he puts it away for dramatic effect, which is like the coolest thing ever. There are few tropes I find more awesome than slicing a katana so fast to the point that a normal eye can't see it, and then the victim's body falls apart as it returns to the scabbard. Naturally, being such a powerful dude, he's also got quite the ego, which makes his interactions with Dante really entertaining due to their opposing ideals, stemming from the different ways that they cope with the loss of their mother. Not gonna lie, I think the dynamic between Dante and Virgil is the most enjoyable aspect of the story in these games, and the fact that this is the game where it's the biggest focus obviously makes it a great time for me. But I think Lady also deserves some credit, partially because of her just being cool and proving that being born half-demon isn't the only way to actually be capable of defeating demons, so it's not like some Dragon Ball situation where certain characters become useless by a certain point due to being human. Clearly, she isn't quite on the same level as the Sons of Sparta, but she's consistently able to hang around in demon-infested areas without much trouble, which is nice. And like I said, she plays a part in helping Dante go through some development, while also having her own shit to deal with but I feel like things will get a bit too spoilery if I go further with her, so I'll leave it at that. Just know that I think what she has here is the single best role of any side character in these games. Unfortunately, she hasn't been super relevant since this entry, but oh well, at least she's still a baddie. There are also a couple other characters in the mix, which I'd rather not say too much about, but I feel like everyone plays their part well. Overall, DMC3 has what I consider to be the best story in the franchise. In some cases, the competition competition doesn't come off as very stiff, with 5 easily being the biggest competitor. And while 5 has more characters and different situations going on throughout it, the main reason I prefer 3 is because it's more efficient and well-paced. It feels like there's never any time being wasted. Usually whenever a cutscene plays, it's either fun to watch or directly affects the plot. Or both. This game took some of the neat ideas presented in DMC1 and turned them into a genuinely compelling world and narrative that myself, along with many others, have a fair amount of investment in. As well as jumpstarting the tidal wave of memes that this series is known for, even if their roots come from a certain dark soul filled with light. Like I said, if you've ever considered getting into the Devil May Cry games, I think 3 is without a doubt the best starting point. I know it's really tempting to hop straight into the 5th entry, especially considering its near-universal glowing reviews and modern polish, but considering the immense amount of shit there is to learn about the combat in these games, I think starting with the slightly more simple systems of DMC3 is a bit less overwhelming, especially since you only play as one character throughout the main story. Plus, you also get a much more 
fresh introduction to the world and characters. I'd be lying if I said it was my favorite game in the series, but it's still one of my favorite titles of the genre. And despite it being around for almost two decades, I think it's a ton of fun, along with having a cool and enjoyable soundtrack. That said, I definitely wouldn't mind if it got a remaster or remake. Polishing it up with some new graphics would be an awesome way to make it more relevant, while maybe taking the opportunity to fix some of the less enjoyable aspects. But of course, that's just my opinion, so feel free to tell me your thoughts on DMC3 in the comments. I had a great time revisiting it for this video, and it feels refreshing to make some non-Souls content every now and then. Anyway, that's all I got for now. Until next time.